Can you give me a brief synopsis of the film? Is that possible in the space of half an hour or so? Well, I don't think it is, really. I don't think it is. Well, try in then 30 seconds. Right. Start again. Jesus Christ! So, a couple weeks ago, I showed a little more than half of what I wanted to show, and said a little less than half of what I wanted to say about Monty Python and the Holy Grail. He's got huge, sharp... He can leap about... Look at the bones! This isn't part two exactly, just another 49-51% to 51 of my love and adoration for this movie. Well, I could stay a bit longer. And so I wanted to... Get on with it! Yes! Get on with it! Yeah! Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, money. Do you know how much it costs? Have, how much did the movie cost? Uh, we have well, the movie cost four hundred thousand dollars. If you do not agree to my commands, then I shall. The producer rang me up, and he said, um, "You know, we don't have a very big budget. Would you very mind very much sharing your hotel room?" <laughs> what the f are you talking about? <laughs> I'm a film star. What happens now? Well, now, uh, Lancelot, uh, Galahad and I uh, wait until nightfall and then leap out of the rabbit, uh, taking the French uh, by surprise. So, Holy Grail, released in 1975, was the first of Monty Python's feature-length projects, and by a country mile, it's most financially restricted, directed by the two Terrys of the group, Terry Gilliam, and Terry Jones. You come to this mark there, to where Suko is. Suko, you can turn over. We do tag team directing. And he finishes that, he'll come out here and exhaustedly tap me on the shoulder and I'll rush into action and away we'll go. <laughs> Who leaps out? Uh, Lancelot, Galahad, and I. Uh, leap out of the rabbit. Uh, and, uh, oh. and from the first day of Shooting Grail, the two are faced with challenge after challenge. There it is! The Bridge of Death! Oh, right. We had first of all chosen an impossible location. It was about a half a mile up Glencoe. So everything had to be humped by Sherpas up the mountain. We got up there, the very first shot of the film, the big moment that the camera turns and it jams. Ask me the questions, bridge keeper. I'm not afraid. So we didn't have a sound camera, and all our great late plans were suddenly up in the air. What is your name? My name is Sir Lancelot of Camelot. What? Is your quest to seek the Holy Grail? It is an incredible location, no camera, and uh, <laughs> no experience. That's the worst thing. What is your favorite color? Blue. Right, off you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. The Pythons only had one sound camera on set because they could only afford one. They shot what they could for the Bridge of Death sequence on mute and picked the rest up later, all the while Graham Chapman, who played Arthur, W.G. Grace Rest His Soul, couldn't even cross the bridge without a double due to symptoms of severe undiagnosed alcohol withdrawal. And that was just day one. <laughs> actually, I'm surprised that uh, everybody was uh, in such a good mood, actually, looking at the outtakes. Um, there's a lot of laughter going on. I hadn't remembered the laughter. All I remembered was the agony of filming it. When we had so little money, there were four umbrellas on the whole set. <laughs> and this nasty chain mail, which was knitted string, would start getting damp. And by nine o'clock, you were cold and wet. And then at six o'clock, when the first assistant said wrap, there was this rush, wasn't there, for the cars. Do you remember? Because there was only the about car, the enough car. hot water for 40% of the people at the hotel. I order you to be quiet. Order? Who does he think he is? <laughs> I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. For what little money the Pythons had to work with, though, that they could afford to make a feature-length film at all was quite literally a rock and roll miracle. I'm interested in the way this film has been backed financially because you haven't got the usual sort of backers. You've got um, the Pink Floyd and a lot of, Zed, lot of rock and money, and yeah. Because that's, um, I mean, I think that's a hardcore Python fans. You know, we've got uh, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, we've got a lot of record companies: Ireland, uh, Chrysalis, Charisma and Michael White, the theatre producer. And, you know, that's, uh, I think they, they are the real hardcore Python freaks, you know. And this isn't my nose, it's a false one. It was basically a fan-supported movie. Will? Well, we did do the nose. The nose? And the hat. But she's a witch! Yeah. Then once the movie was financed, it was just the not-so-simple matter of, well, actually staying under budget. 
and playing to the team's strengths in order to get away with stuff most films just never could. I'm an enchanter. By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? For instance, after scene five, we're introduced to the book of the film, which was really just a clever ploy to move the plot along without having to actually shoot anything more than some pages turning on Terry Gilliam's living room floor, his wife's hand, and a gorilla glove from a local junk shop. Similar deal with Gilliam's animations, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. And there was much rejoicing. And something I also mentioned was the fact that the shooting script for Holy Grail was really, really tight. Sure, any number of things might have been added or altered, even right up until the last minute, but remarkably little ad-libbing actually occurred once the camera started rolling. This allowed the Terrys to shoot only what they needed, and very, very fast. Five or six weeks for the whole thing, keeping costs down. With a sacred quest. If he will give us food and shelter for the night, he may join us in our quest for the Holy Grail. But what charmed me the most was the way they shot. God! Long, wide, and uninterrupted. Until I come and get him. Not to leave the room, even if you come and get him. No, no. Until I come and get him. Not a lot of inserts, not a lot of close-ups. Message for you, sir. Not so unlike a lot of TV at the time. Fast and economical. The world they were all coming from anyway. Uh, did you get that shot all right, sound? Yes, fine. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't a bit too wicked, was it? I mean, oh, no. too cruel. Oh, no, 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 great. no, great. no, super. Oh, well, uh, I think it shows I'm human, don't you? Yeah, it's great. Super, it's great. Well, the Sharabang's here. Come on, everybody. Bye. <laughs> because, see, if you're smart about it, you can shoot an entire wedding massacre scene Ha-ha! like this. <laughs> Or you can just use the same one shot over and over and over and over and over and, over and get a joke out of it. Hey! It probably didn't hurt their budget either that the Pythons inherently saved a bundle on actors, with the six of them playing and double playing the vast majority of roles. The troupe says most of the casting was determined by who'd written what. If a scene centered around a particular night and a particular Python wrote that scene, he'd play that night. It's, it's gotten weird. There were a couple days where we actually couldn't keep track of who was who. <laughs> You couldn't do one shot because John had to be somebody else, so we couldn't do that shot, so we didn't have to do that shot, which meant moving the camera over there. Five, three, ta, three, three. Which meant changing that there. Just, we got it done there. Is there someone else up there we could talk to? No, now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. As for everybody else, you have a couple of actresses. The witch, played by John Cleese's wife at the time. I'm not a witch, I'm not a witch. The nuns of Castle Anthrax. They have a basic medical training, yes. But largely, it was just locals or crew. The detective here was the film's production designer. One of the constables, the visual effects photographer. The film's composer was an extra. Either create the lump in the throat, or uh, back, make the back hairs stick out. And all the rest were either tourists visiting Dune Castle, in the case of the wedding scene, or students from the University of Stirling in Scotland, about 175 of them in the case of Arthur's army at the end. A lot, French person. but not nearly enough. Today the blood of many a valiant knight shall be avenged. The fact is, we, there were only about 200 extras, and we were set up with this enormous battle scene which we couldn't film because we didn't have enough actors. Till each one of you lies dead. My daughter, she said, was that the ending? And I said, yeah, I wrote it. She said, that was shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go too deep into all of that for the sake of spoilers, but let's just say it was all a very inventive solution to what was ultimately a budgetary issue. And again, the kind of solution that only works because of the nature of the film, and one you might only consider because of the nature of the budget. But all that is also Grail's biggest secret and boon. Being silly, being unexpected. Quite 
getting from A to B by whatever means necessary. As Terry Gilliam has said, if you maintain a low standard of production from the start, you can get away with anything. It's what allows you to solve quote-unquote problems in the plot, like this. When suddenly, the animator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> the cartoon peril was no more. The quest for the Holy Grail could continue. And besides, hey, you know, endings... Just cut it. Cut. 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 Endings are hard. I know sometimes life can be tough. And you feel like you just had enough. 